Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study tonight. Thank you for your people. Thank you for their love and desire and interest. Thank you for the joy of the Lord. We are praying, O oh Lord, you are blessed. Everyone at the Bible study today in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that all those who are still coming on the way, you speed up their journey so they meet us here in time. And Lord, we will all be blessed together in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's all be seated. In our Bible study, we're now in Revelation chapter 6. I just need to remind you, because we've been studying together, that we started from chapter 1. In chapter 1, we saw the picture and a portrait of the glorified Christ. It was such a marvelous, mysterious picture and portrait that when John the Beloved saw Jesus Christ, even though he had seen Jesus in his earthly ministry, and he had seen Jesus as Jesus rose from the dead, but this time, seeing the glorified Christ, he fell at his feet as one dead because of the beauty and the glory and the splendor and the majesty of what he saw. Then the Lord touched him and raised him up and he gave him an assignment and said, All the message he has to the seven churches in Asia Minor, he shall write everything down and he shall send it to them. You have been long enough here to understand that the book of Revelation is a lot symbolic. And that number seven is symbolic of the whole church, the total church, the fullness of the church. And so he was writing that to the whole church. You remember, as we studied chapters two and three, at the end of every message to every church, the Lord Jesus said, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Which means then, the message we have in the book of Revelation is for the whole church in the whole age from the beginning of Jesus coming and starting the church until the church will be raptured and then we have studied chapters 2 and 3 and Jesus Christ wrote to the church in Ephesus the church in Smyrna, the church in Pagamos, the church in Tatyra, the church in Sardis, the church in Philadelphia the church in Laodicea and from all the things that Jesus wrote to those churches you will see the expectation of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the whole church Number one, he wants the church to be alive. Alive with life eternal. Because he told the church in Sardis, he said, you have a name that you live, but you are dead. Perfect the things that remain. Because I have not found your work perfect in my sight. He wanted the church to be spotless and to be holy and to be righteous. And you will see the strain. You'll see the commandment. You'll see the counseling. You'll see the expectation of the Lord Jesus Christ as we read through all those letters to the seven churches. And then we come to chapter 4. At the end of chapter 3, the church has been raptured. The church has been taken away from the earth. And the church is in the very presence of God. Did you notice in chapter 4, when we study chapter 4, everything is around the throne, about the throne, upon the throne, by the side of the throne, and before the throne. And so you find that in chapter 4, the centrality of chapter 4 is the throne. And the one that sits upon the throne, that's the almighty God himself. But you find in that chapter 4, that the church is already there. Because you have the 24 elders, and those 24 elders, they represent the church. How do we know that? Because those 24 elders said they were praising God, salvation unto our God. Because he has redeemed us from the earth, from all kindreds and all tongues and all languages and all nations. And he has made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That's how we know that the church in chapter 4 is already in heaven. And then in chapter 5, is, uh, it is a wonderful thing because almighty God sat upon the throne and then he made a proclamation because there's a book in his hand and this book is a scroll that is sealed seven times over and the proclamation came who is able to take the book out of the hand of the almighty God and then to open the seals thereof because it's in the opening of the seals that there'll be a revelation a revealing and a disclosing of the content of that scroll, of that book. I explained to you at that time that if you take a long sheet of paper 
and then you are writing. When you write, you fold a little, seal it up. Then you write and fold more until you fold it seven times. And so if you are going to unroll it, if you are going to reveal it, if you are going to disclose it, you will break the first seal. And then you'll open it and read what is there. And then open the second seal and read what is there. Until the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh. But what does that book contain? I explained to you at that time. It's the title Deed of the Earth. Because the earth had been in the hand of the usurper. In the hand of the devil. But then the Lord Jesus is about to take it back. Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so when there was nobody found immediately to come and take the book from the hand of the ancient of days, the one that sat on the throne, John said, he wept very much. And then one of the elders came to him and said, you, you don't have to weep because somebody has prevailed. Somebody has overcome and he's coming now and he's going to take the book. What's his name? It's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. It's the root of David. And then John looked up wanting to see a lion and behold what he saw, he saw a lion as if it had been slain because behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world Jesus Christ crucified for us who died for us but was standing he had risen from the dead now he's glorified now he's a lion because the lion is a king of the forest and so Jesus Christ the king of kings and the Lord of Lords, he prevailed. And then he, he took the book. When he took that book, he had not even opened the book. He just took it from the hand of the Almighty God. The whole of heaven and the whole of the earth and the whole universe burst into praise and worship because he took the book. Now you'll find in chapter 5, the centrality of chapter 5 is that book and the worship of the Lamb. But in chapter 6 is the wrath of the Lamb. In chapter 5, worship. In chapter 6, wrath. And now we come to this chapter 6. Because now, after Jesus Christ had taken the scroll of the book from the hand of God, he needs to do something. He'll be opening it one by one. And as he opens the first seal, then you will see a drama, a demonstration. You will see what is actually going to take place. And then he opens the second one. He opens the third one and the fourth one until he opens the seventh one. When he, the seventh one actually contains the seven trumpet judgments. And then the seventh trumpet contains also the verse, the bold judgment. And when everything is ended, then the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that's still in the future. That's what we're still going to look at in the book of Revelation as we continue to study. But I want you to look at the one today. Today we're looking at Revelation chapter 6, reading from verse 1. Before I read the text, let me just tell you this, that the chapter opens with the opening of the first seal. Christ, the only worthy one to take the seven seal scroll from the hand of the Almighty, has taken the scroll. Each as each seal is broken, the content of the scroll is acted out on earth. And John sees and records the acts, the drama, the demonstration of what will be taking place. The events reveal judgment and wrath, the wrath of God on the earth. Those who go through that period of the breaking of the seal will cry out. Look at their cry in chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. And said unto the rocks and to the, and to the mountains and the rocks, follow us and hide us from the face of him that that seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand that tells you then that the opening of the seals actually will bring the wrath of god the judgment of god the indignation of god upon this whole earth actually the seven seals reveal the period of judgment the period of wrath the period of indignation and suffering on the earth during the great tribulation that's between the rapture of the church and the return of the lord jesus christ the seven seals reveal the whole proceedings of the almighty after god's people are taken out of the earth until they come back with christ to reign with him in his millennial reign in his millennial kingdom now the subject of the tribulation seems very confusing to many Christians, uh, you need to understand there are two kinds of tribulations. Number one, there's a general tribulation. 
That's what we go through now. Persecution, trial, trouble, heartache, sorrow. Whatever it is we're going through now, that's general. And this general tribulation happened in the past to the disciples, to the apostles, and to all the Christians that have ever lived. And then it's happening at the present time. But the great tribulation is very different. That is in the future. Always have it in mind. Whenever you read in your Bible and you come across the word tribulation, you ask yourself, is it general tribulation, past and present? Or is it the great tribulation, which is still in the future? The source of these two kinds of tribulations, they are different. The purposes are different. And the period of the two types of tribulation are different. The general tribulation, it started from the time of the Lord Jesus Christ with his own disciples. And he told them that they should be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. In the world, ye shall have tribulation. You see that? That's the general one that had started more than 2,000 years ago. And it is still going on. But the great tribulation is actually for a period, some will say for three and a half years. There is this special tribulation, intense tribulation for seven years. If you read in Daniel chapter 9, it is, uh, the, it is the last week of Daniel's 70 weeks. This is the 70th week. And there is, it's a day in the prophecy, a year for a day. And so it's a seven-year period that the Antichrist will make a deal, a covenant with the people of Israel. And then in the middle of that week, that period, in the middle, which is three and a half years, he'll break that covenant. And then an intense kind of tribulation will begin called the Great Tribulation. That will be after the rapture of the church. The inhabitants of the world will go through that seven-year period of severe suffering. The period covered by the opening of the seven seals. All the references are there. I'm sure you are going to read them when you get home. Revelation chapter 6 then begins the account of the tragic terrible things that will happen during the period of the great tribulation. The subject today is the beginning of the great day of his wrath. The beginning of the great day of his wrath. Look at chapter 6 verse 17. For the great day of his wrath is come. The great day of his wrath is come. But what we're looking at today is the beginning of that great day of the wrath of God. I divide the message to four parts. You say, why not three? Why four? Because uh, these four seals go together. And we're looking at them from verse 1 all through to verse 8 of Revelation chapter 6. And we have divided each with all those seals. Seal number one is point one. Seal number two is point two. Seal number three is point three. And seal number four is point four. We now go to uh, number one is conquering through deception and false peace. Number two, it's right there on your outline. Conflicts with destruction through fierce powers. Number three, the consequence of destitution, farming, and poverty. And then number three, the carnage and death of us fourth part. Let's go to point number one. In point number one, it tells us in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder and one of the four bees saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Uh, you see here, when uh, the seal was opened, the first part of the scroll, of the roll, of the book, was unrolled to reveal what is written therein. But instead of John coming to read, John saw the action. The drama is saw the demonstration of what is written there so that it is acted out. And what he saw is this. He said, 
when the lamb opened one of the seals, remember, he's the only worthy one, the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, because of his sacrifice, because he shed his blood, is the only one. There is nobody like Jesus. There is none as worthy as the Lord Jesus Christ. He opened the first seal. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. Even the opening is the voice. It sounded like the, the noise of thunder. And then one of the four beasts, I've told you already, or read it, one of the cherubims, one of the living creatures, said unto him, John, John, come. Come and see. Come and see this. Come and see what is going to happen as a result of opening the four seal. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now as you look at that verse 2, it mentions the horse. Do you know that as uh, the second seal is open, also another horse comes out in verse 4. It says, and there went out another horse that was red, the first horse white. And the second um, horse read, if you look at verse 5, and when he had opened the third seal, I had the third beast, living creature, cherubim, say, come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. That's the third horse, and it's black. And then you go to verse 8, and I looked at her opening the, third, the first seal, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. So then you understand that as we look at these four seals, horses are significant. And the horses come up, they come out. I need to show you that in the word of God, as you think about the horse, you're actually thinking about the time of battle. The time of battle. The time of the great tribulation, what time will it be? Is it not a time of battle? Is it not a time of wars and rumors of wars? Is it not a time of suffering? Is it not a time of bloodshed? Is it not a time of famine? That's exactly what we're reading about here. If you look at Proverbs chapter 21, verse 31, the horse is prepared against the day of battle. The horse is prepared against the day of battle. Seal number one is open. A horse comes out. Seal number two is open and his horse comes out. Seal number three is open, another horse. And seal number four, another horse. And the horse is prepared against the day of battle. In Job chapter 39. Job chapter 39, reading from verse 19. In Job 39 verse 19. As thou given the horse strength, as thou closed his neck with thunder, it's Almighty God talking here. Almighty God started talking to Job from chapter 38. And chapter 39, Almighty God continued. And he is the one describing the strength of the, of the horse. Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He pours in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He goes on to meet the armed men. He mocketh at fear and is not affrighted, is not afraid, neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him, the glittering spear and the shield. He swallows the ground with fierceness and rage. Neither believeth he it, it is that it is the sound of the trumpet. That's the trumpet calling people to alarm and war. He says among the trumpets, ah, ah, and he smelleth the battle afar off. The thunder of the captains and the shouting. He smelleth the battle afar off. So you understand then, as we look at Revelation chapter 6, you see here there is battle. And as you see there is battle, uh, what is this? Come back to Revelation chapter 6, reading from verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. Now, whenever you see the warriors of those days, and they had bows in their hand, what else will they have? They'll have arrows. Because they will bend that bow and shoot their arrows. And it is as they shoot the arrows, they will destroy the enemy. And then they will win the victory. But look at this one here. I saw, and behold, the white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, no arrow. What does that mean then? That he doesn't have to shoot any arrow. And immediately, when they saw him, a crown was given unto him. 
a crown was given unto him, and he went he went forth, conquering and to conquer. Can you think about that? Somebody sitting on a white horse already, because he was sitting on a white horse, that's like he knew that was a conqueror. He knew that he had overcome. He knew that he was much everyone. But then he didn't have to shoot any arrow. He conquered everyone. He conquered the nations. He conquered the world without having any arrow to shoot. Who is this? Now, is the, this person is somebody trying to give peace to the world. I will say that because if you look at verse 4, after the second seal had been opened, and there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. In uh, the first seal, there was peace on the earth. It's like uh, somebody came and he said, I'll bring unity to the world. I'll bring peace to the world. And that's what the world is looking for. If you look at all the situations now in all the governments, they are getting united. They want peace. You have a peacekeeping force here, another peacekeeping force here, another peacekeeping force almost all over the world. Because the world is looking for peace. But one day, a deceiver is going to come. And this deceiver, when he comes, is going to say, don't trouble yourself. I'll sign a treaty. And then he will settle the problem with Israel and the Middle East. And the people of Israel, they will trust him. And they will accept him because he'll bring a kind of peace to them. And they will say, this is the person that we're looking for. He will not need to fight any battle at all. And he'll unite all the people together. That's why Daniel says he will make a covenant with the people of Israel. And he will break that covenant later in the middle of the week and then there'll be no peace anymore. If you look at Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 Reading from verse 27, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, you will see that this uh, world emperor and world leader uh, that will come, it will come with craft or craftiness. It will come with deception and it will appear as if it's going to give peace to the people. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and it shall confirm the covenant with many for one week with many for one week. And then it says, and in the midst of the week, in the middle of the week, it shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. At the beginning of the week, at the big save, the seven years, he'll tell them, that's at the beginning, the first seal, no problem, you can do your sacrifice. No problem, you can offer your sacrifice. God, I'm not against your religion. I'm not against your politics. I'm not against anything you want to do. All I'm interested in is to give peace to everybody. Here, then it says, for the overspreading of abominations, see, he shall make it desolate. That is, when he breaks the covenant eventually, there will be no peace anymore. And then it says, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. As you read Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, the time is coming. When the people will be thinking, oh, there is peace, there is peace. When actually there is no genuine peace, as you look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 24. Daniel chapter 8, verse 24, and his power shall be mighty. That's the Antichrist. That's a person that comes to give the false peace, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper, and practice, and shall destroy the mighty, and the holy people. That is, eventually, he will turn his back on the Jewish people, after he had made a covenant with them. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft, deception, craftiness to prosper in his hand. And he shall, ma he shall magnify himself in his heart. By peace shall he destroy many. By peace shall he destroy many. He'll be coming to them offering peace. And because the world is looking for peace, they'll be so happy somebody has come. And he's going to give us peace. And through that, he'll destroy many. And then he said, and he shall also stand up against the prince of princes. It will stand up against the Lord, but it shall be broken without hand. That's why we were told in Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, reading from chapter two. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Uh, you will see here uh, talking about the time of this Antichrist, reading from verse three. It says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. 
and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, and that is worshipped, so that he, as God seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might re be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now letteth, hinders, prevents, will let, will hinder, will prevent, until he be taken out of the way. When the church is gone out of the way, that's the, when the Antichrist will appear. And when the church is taken out of the way, the Holy Spirit also is taken out of the way because he will not have the restraining power that he has manifested and exercised all over the world as he used to do in the past. Then he said, and then shall that wicked one be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that all that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but at pleasure in unrighteousness. The Lord is telling us that when that Antichrist comes, he will try to bring some kind of peace. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 5. Looking at First Thessalonians chapter 5, reading from verse 1. But of that time and, that, and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction coming up comes upon them as travail upon a woman or child, and shall, they shall not escape. What does that mean? That is, they'll be rejoicing. Peace has come. As peace has come now, everything is all right. All of a sudden, things will change. The Antichrist will change his tactics. And then, sudden destruction will come. That leads us to point number two. Conflicts with destruction through fierce powers. Conflicts with destructions through fierce powers. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And when he had opened the second seal, I had the second beast say, come and see. John is not ended. And uh, the, the, second, the second seal is opened already. Come and see the content. Dramatized. Acted out. And then he said, and there came another horse that was red. Another horse that was red. When you think about red, what do you think about? It's the color of fire. And it is the color of blood. And that already tells you that it's, there is danger. And even it goes on to say in that same verse, because it says some power was given unto him. That is unto him that sat on that horse to take peace from the earth. That is the false peace that was there. It will be short-lived. It will be for a brief moment of time. While the people are rejoicing, now we're united all over the world. And there is no war. And now this uh, person that come is a good, good ruler, is a great ruler. And we have submitted ourselves to him. Why are we looking for another Messiah? Why are we looking for another Savior? This one has given us peace. This, they'll be saying, is the Prince of Peace. While they're rejoicing in that false peace, he will appear. He will change his tactics. He will change everything and he will come on a red horse and he will take peace from the earth. That's international. That's global. That's universal. Not just in one country, not just in the Middle East, not just in China, but all over the world from the earth. And that they should kill one another. War will break out. And then it says, and there was given unto him a great sword. Uh, you see here, as this second seal is opened, this red horse charges forth, and the rider is given a great horse. He also is given power to take peace from the earth. The false peace on the earth. During the first seal is not taken away from the earth. 
and the people begin to kill one another. That's the consequence of the events predicted by the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 24? Matthew chapter 24, in fact, you are going to find out that Matthew chapter 24, from verse 3 all through to verse 8, they tally, they agree with these four seals we're looking at today. Look at it, Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. That's the first seal. Deception. When the Antichrist will come, and with all these uh, army and company and assembly of false prophets saying that they are Christ, because in verse 5 it says, For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. I come to give you peace. I am Christ. What's my name? I'm the Prince of Peace. I'm the one to give peace to the earth. That is the opening of the first seal. And shall deceive many. And then in verse 6, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. That's seal number 2. As the second seal is broken, then the false peace that came by deception and captiveness of the Antichrist, that is taken away. And now you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that you see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Why the end is not yet? Because that's just the second seal. There's still going to be the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh. So when Jesus said that when you're hearing about those wars, and you're hearing about those rumors of wars, don't be troubled. The end is not yet. You still have a long way to go. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines. Those famines, you'll see that seal number three. Because in seal number three, we'll read it just now, it's the time when uh, food is measured, it's rationed because of famine. And then pestilences and earthquakes and in diverse places, that's seal number four. And Jesus said, all these are the beginning of sorrows. That is, it's still warming up. The wrath of God, the indignation of God, the judgment of God coming upon the earth at the time of the great tribulation. When you go to the fourth seal, it, it, there's still more to come intense, terrible, terrifying, and frightening uh, things that will happen upon the earth. As you look at uh, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, uh, you will see what uh, the word of God is talking about because this is a time when peace is taken away from the earth and then there is war and there is bloodshed because the rider that comes out is coming out on a red horse. In Jeremiah chapter 8, reading from verse 15, we looked for peace, but no good came. And for a time of health, and behold, trouble. Uh, you, you see that then in verse 16, the snoring of the horses was heard from Dan, and the whole land trembled at the sounding of the neighing of the strong ones, for they are come, and have devoured the land, and all that is in it, the city, and those that dwell there. Therein. Uh, that's the time when there will be real devastation and destruction because of the wars that will be fought at that time. In Isaiah chapter 19, Isaiah chapter 19, I'm reading to you from verse 2, describing this uh, period of time. It tells us in verse 2, and I said, and I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight everyone against his brother, and everyone against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. As you go to Jeremiah, look at Jeremiah chapter 4. In Jeremiah chapter 4, reading from verse 19. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 19. My bowels, my bowels. I am pained at, the, at my very heart. My heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because that was heard. Oh, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried. For the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly and my tent spoiled. And my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sorted children. And they have, not, they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. But to do good they have no knowledge. It continues to say. And I beheld the earth. And lo it was without form and void and the heavens and 
they had no light. I beheld the mountains and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. Do you see that? That's the time of the great tribulation, and this describing what will happen at the time of the opening of the second seal. Verse 27, for thus, as the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate. Yet will I not make a full end. Uh -huh. Many people will die because of the war, because of that man that is uh, sitting on the red horse, that is giving his sword, and then there is war all over the world, and the peace in the world, everything is taken away. But that's just the second seal. There will still be people left on the earth. Yet will I not make a full end. Because number three is still to come. Number four is still to come. Number five is still to come until number seven in verse 28. For they shall the earth mourn and the heavens above be black because I have spoken it, have purposed it and will not repent. I will not change my mind. Neither will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and the bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken and not a man dwell therein. And you will see that it is describing the time of war and the time of trouble. At this, as this second seal is opened, you have seen that deception falls and then after that there is war. But then what is still to come will be famine and then pestilence and death. All these you'll find in Matthew chapter 24 and then you'll find in Revelation chapter 6. What will be happening on the earth? During the period of the breaking of the seals will be the outpouring of the wrath of God executed by the Lamb, by Christ. The Antichrist will be involved as he will be allowed to act out his wickedness to the full without any restraint of the Holy Spirit. With the opening of this second seal, the red horse appears. What breaks out on the earth? You know, red, as I told you, is the color of, red, of, of the blood. And the red horseman will burst the earth in blood. The red horseman depicts warfare, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. That means there will be international as well as civil war. But then that's not the end as I said. We come to number three now. The third seal. As we look at Revelation chapter 6, we're looking at verses 5 and 6. And when I, when he had opened the third seal, I had the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on it had a pair of balances. Uh, to start with, when it says a black horse, what does black represent? If you look at Lamentation chapter 5, Lamentation chapter 5, uh, you will see what uh, black represents. In Lamentation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10. Lamentation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. We got our bread or the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. We got our bread at the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. So black then is talking to us about farming. What will happen when there is war, international war, war all over the earth? There will be no time to cultivate. There will be no time to plant. There will be no time for food production. And therefore, at such a time, what will normally follow war is farming. Because it's not a localized war. It's not civil war in a single country. It's war that ravages and destroys, makes desolate the whole earth. That's the reason why what will follow that war will be farming. As you come back to Revelation chapter 6, you will see in verse 5, it says, And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. He's going to weigh something. What's he weighing? Look at verse 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny. 
That is, if they are going to eat, if they are going to buy food, they'll measure it for them at the time of the opening of this third seal. That's why it says he had balances and then a measure of wheat. That's two pints of wheat will be sold for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see that ye hurt not oil and wine. Now listen to this. You see, at that time, when war will break out in the second seal, and he'll be killing one another. And people are running elter skelter for the protection and security of their lives. There'll be nobody farming because uh, they are just afraid. And then, as that war is almost subsiding and it comes to the next seal, there will be the consequence of that is that there'll be no food. And the little food that remains, they'll be rationing it and weighing it for people to buy. And when it says a measure of wheat for a penny, you know what that means? In those days, a penny was a man's wage, wage for a day. That is, if a man will really work hard, that, that means that he'll earn a penny. And uh, this measure of wheat is what an average man will eat if he's eating moderately. The implication is, when a man works hard, all he can receive for that whole day will be enough to pay for his food for that day. Not to talk of his wife. Not to talk of his children. And then when it says uh, three measures of barley for a penny. Um, actually, barley is of a lower quality, nutritional value than wheat. That means if somebody will go for something of low nutritional value, he'll be able to at least provide for other members of the family. But it will not be very nourishing. And that's what he's telling us here. Because the third seal being broken is the coming force of the black horse. And these represent farming. I read that. To you already in Revelation in uh, Lamentation chapter 5, verse 10. Farming is one of the consequences of war. The worldwide war of the second seal will hinder cultivation and food production. And that will result in worldwide farming and the rationing of food. The rider on the horse had a pair of balances in his hand to measure, to weigh food for sale. And uh, you see, if you, if you go to Leviticus chapter 26, verse 26, it says, And when I have broken the staff of your bread, they shall deliver you your bread by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. And that's what is happening here. If you turn to Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, you will see the sequence of the events that Jesus Christ described. And you will see, first, number one is deception. Number two is war. Number three that follows after that is famine. It says in uh, verse 6, Matthew chapter 24, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines. There shall be famines. That is the third seal. And, and so they were learning then that it will be a terrible time. A terrible time indeed because of that terrible time of famine. And as you continue, you will find that it's not uh, just uh, Matthew alone. All this had been predicted before in Lamentation chapter 4. Lamentation chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 4. Lamentation chapter 4, reading from verse 4. In this Lamentation chapter 4, verse 4, it says, The tongue of the sucking child cleaved to the roof of his mouth. For thirst, the young children ask bread, and no man breaketh eat unto them. They that did feed delicately are del desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace donk heels. For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom. That was overthrown as in a moment, and no hand stayed on her. And Nazarites were purer than snow. That's white. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. Their visage now is blacker than coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaved to their bones. It is withered and it has become at like his cheek. They that were slain of the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. That is the people, the people living at the time of the third, of the third seal. They'll be saying, why didn't I die at the time of the second seal when there was war? 
And then they just, uh, you know, they, they put a dagger or the slaughter or whatever it is in a few minutes and the person is dead. But this person uh, dying the world with hunger and just pining away with hunger. It says, they that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger. For these pine away, streaking through for want of the fruit of the field. Uh, that's what will be happening at that time. Remember this, describing the time of the great tribulation. I pray you will not be there. You will be a real child of God. You will have gone. You will be in heaven rejoicing with the people of God and with the Lord Jesus Christ. While the people on earth will be suffering, you will escape in Jesus' name. I come to point number four. is the carnage and the death of, the, of earth's false part. A look at Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast, the fourth living creature, say, Come and see him. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Now, as you look at this one, it says power was given unto them. What does it mean them? Number one, death. Number two, hell. And both of them, they just rampage the whole earth. And power was given unto both hell and death and hell to kill the fourth part of the earth with what or the sword that's what we saw in, in uh, the zeal number two seal number two and then to kill with hunger isn't that what we have seen already in seal number three and then it says and with death this is what we've seen in seal number four you know the implication of that it means that the second seal is broken and then there is war and there is sword and there is killing and even though that is still continuing, overlapping it will be the third seal. That is, when the third seal is broken and then there is farming, the war is still continuing. And then as the sword is there, the war is going on, the farming is there, then the fourth seal will come, overlapping everything. It is not going to be in the world at that time. You will not be here. You will be with the Lord in heaven. It says it will, it will kill with number one the sword, number two the hunger, number three death, and the beast of the earth. When it says the beast of the earth, you know in the past, many, many years ago, before, before people knew anything, before they understood the word of God properly, they will read this and say, ah, ah, how can this happen? In the world of civilization, do you mean that lions will come into the cities and just kill people and the leopards and the tigers will come and kill people? people what are you talking about they have told us right now that the the most dangerous animal in the world is the rat and that the rat each rat carries about 35 diseases and that in the many many years ago centuries ago actually the bubonic plague that killed many many people that it was through the rats that those things were, car were carried on in fact they have discovered now that uh, if you have a pair of rats and these pair of rats, if they begin to reproduce, that they can reproduce thousands, millions of themselves in a period of, th of three years. And they have also discovered that if you were to kill, for example, and, and destroy um, about 95% of the rats in a community, they will reproduce themselves again and fill the land and recover everything in about another one year. And they carry a lot of plagues and diseases with them. And and so when it says that they will ravage the earth, even the beasts of the earth, many animals and, you know, all those things that will destroy and kill many, many people. Now as we look at this, and it says this is what will happen. You will see that four things are mentioned in this verse, number one, the sword. Number two, the hunger. Number three, death. Uh, when it says death, actually pestilences, diseases, or plagues. And then the beasts of the earth. In Leviticus chapter 26. In Leviticus chapter 26, you see a particular principle. Because you see that as you are looking at um, number one, number two, number three, number four, it's like uh, the thing is increasing in intensity. And actually that's what the Lord had said in Leviticus chapter 26, reading from verse 22. Leviticus 26, 22, I will also send the wild beasts among you. 
And we shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number and your highways shall be desolate. And then it goes on to verse 25. It says, and I will bring a sword upon you and that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence and among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. Do you see verse 22? Beasts. And then verse 25, sword. The latter part of verse 25, it says pestilence. And then in verse 26, and when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. That's farming. You have the four mentioned there. And as you look at Jeremiah chapter 15, Jeremiah chapter 15, actually the world if we're reading the Bible, we cannot claim ignorance because these are the things that God said he will do. And those things are coming and they will come with full intensity at the time of the great tribulation. That's the reason why we ought to prepare now. We should prepare so that we are not here at the time of the great tribulation. In Jeremiah chapter 15, reading from verse 2, and it shall come to pass, if they say unto thee, whither shall we go forth? Then thou shalt tell them, Thus says the Lord, Such as are for death to death, and such as are for sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as for the captivity to the captivity. Uh, you will see then that uh, when God says that he was going to pour out his indignation upon the people, actually, it's coming. And it's the time of the great tribulation. That's why Jeremiah says in chapter 30, Jeremiah chapter 30, Reading from verse 5, Jeremiah 30, verse 5. For thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling and of fear and of peace and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man does travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but ye shall be saved out of it. A, a terrible time is coming and uh, it, uh, it says, if you look at uh, Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 11, Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 11, and uh, the things that will take place at that time, and as Jesus Christ described it, he described what, um, what it will look like. It says, and great earthquake shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs. Uh, shall there be from heaven? Well, as uh, the seals are broken, the condition of the people on earth becomes more and more terrible, more and more unbearable. The first seal is broken, and a pale horse uh, comes, a pale horse appears. The original word for uh, this pale horse actually is uh, similar to the color of, uh, of um, green. The pale green. It says the rider is named as death. And hell follows closely to claim the victims, the messengers of death. During this period will be sword and hunger, famine, pestilence, and terrible diseases. And the beasts of the earth. The time of worldwide tribulation on earth will be awful. Awful time to live in the world. Death will claim one quarter of the population of the world during this fourth seal alone. Didn't you read it in that chapter 6? Revelation chapter 6 verse 8 when it says, And I looked and behold the pale horse and the name of him that, of, that sat and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto them over one fourth of the earth. Power was given unto them over one quarter of the earth to kill with the sword, to kill with hunger, to kill with death, and to kill with the bees of the, of the field. The beasts that will ravage the people, the beasts of the earth at that time. That means then, if the population of the world is 6 billion, that means that 1.5 billion, that is 1 billion and 500 million will be killed just in that period of three and a half years because that's just a fourth part of the great tribulation. A terrible time. 
They're saying, is there any hope for the world? That the world will not experience this great tribulation? I'm sorry. There is no hope for the world. It will come, and it is coming. But you say, is there any hope for you as an individual that you will not go through this great tribulation? Yes, yes, yes. A thousand times, yes. You can escape, and you will escape. If you repent and forsake your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, forgiveness is available, salvation is available, sanctification, holiness is available, and then you hold fast, living by the grace of God. And then, by the grace of God, when the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive shall be caught up together with them, we will escape or have gone before the great tribulation begins. In Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, verse 34. And take it to yourselves. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, and with the cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. For as a sneer shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. And to stand before the Son of Man. Will you escape? Rise up and pray.